team. If you praise God for what he's done, say amen. Amen. As Vice President George Bush, who was the Vice President for Ronald Reagan, he was uh, representing the U.S. at the funeral of the former Soviet Union uh, leader, uh, Leon Brezhnev. And Vice President Bush says that he was moved in that service by the protest by Brezhnev's widow. She stood at the casket that was open of her husband. And she stood there motionless looking into the casket and right as the soldiers, the Russian guard, touched the casket to close the lid for one last time, she reached in and with great courage, probably a gesture that surely ranks with one of the most profound civil disobedience of that time in Russia. She reached down and on the chest of her husband she made the sign of the cross. Now there in the citadel of that secular and atheistic power that we know of that time called Russia, the wife of a man who led all of that, hoped that her husband was wrong. She hoped that he was wrong because her hope for him was eternal life. The life that was represented in that cross, Jesus, the one who died on the cross so that we might have life. She was hoping and praying mercy from Jesus on her husband, eternal inheritance. Most of you would say you have either been asked or heard the question, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you're going? It's a question that has been asked a lot. The question really begs the question of, are you saved? Have you surrendered? Have you given your life to Christ in a way that you know that you have an inheritance? That you know that this inheritance that has been promised to you is yours to claim, to have. Not just now, but forever. That's our plan, right? I mean, we plan for everything or at least we try to, most do. Um, the insurance agent one time was in my house years ago, and he made the question, if you die tonight, do you know that your wife is going to be taken care of? Not where was I going. He just wanted to know that my wife was taken care of. And then he said, are you planning to have children? And I said, well, I hope so. And at that time we did. And he said, well, you certainly want to have enough life insurance so that your wife can be taken care of and your children can be taken care of and your debts can be taken care of if something happens to you. Now, those are really good questions to ask um, and, and to consider because all of us want our loved ones to be taken care of. But that's only going to bring some temporary peace. It's only going to bring uh, some temporary satisfaction in this life. And that is a good satisfaction to have. But God offers us peace in a different way. In his great mercy, God not only provided an inheritance for you and I, all that would come to faith in him, this inheritance of heaven... But he also said that we could enjoy that kingdom today. We could have kingdomship today. This assurance of eternal life 
is also lives in us here and now. The Apostle Peter, in this opening letter that he wrote to believers, that's us. Written in the first century, he is writing to us today just as much as he was writing to the Christians of that time. Says, we have an inheritance, and this inheritance is unchanging, and this inheritance is the same today and tomorrow because it is a lasting birthright that God has given us. And we are to remain steadfast in it and to praise God for it regardless of the trials that come along, Peter says. I tell you, I need to hear that today. That regardless of the trials that come, regardless of of what's ahead, God's got me. God's got it. Because of the inheritance that he has given to us and to me. If you have your Bibles, we now, for the 14th time, will read this passage of Scripture. And uh, you'd say, well, haven't we covered these nine verses well in 14 years? And I would say we probably have. Uh, But every time that Bill and I preached up to 2015 while he was here, um, and then since 2015, we have preached from this, and I usually pick a little different uh, focus, uh, a word or words that... um, Uh, I want to lift up or feel, uh, definitely feel the Lord is having me to lift up. And today, certainly I feel like this passage and the focus of this sermon uh, fits today for us on this 14th anniversary. So the first nine verses of the first chapter of 1 Peter. And you will see that verse 3 is where our name, we took our name from. That's why we use this passage each year. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood May grace and peace be yours in the fullest, fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even now, for a little while, if necessary, you will have distress by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with glory inexpressible and full of glory. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, Father, that you would illuminate our hearts and minds this morning for what you hold for us through this, your holy word. I pray this in your name. Amen. Rejoicing in our lasting inheritance. We rejoice at a lot of different things. Uh, In fact, I would say that we rejoice in events or things that happen to us. Have you ever seen anybody walking down the street and all of a sudden you go, yeah, woo! And you walk up to them and they say, 
you say to them, well, why are you rejoicing? Well, I don't know. I'm just rejoicing. Usually they would say, oh, something just happened. And they'll tell you this wonderful event or something that's happened in their life. And this is why they are rejoicing. We rejoice as our children are engaged or maybe as grandparents our children have grandkids and we rejoice in that. We rejoice when we have a, a graduate or we get a promotion. We have rejoicing that takes place. And Peter encourages us that we are to rejoice and focus on this living hope that God has given us. He says, praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. That's the same birth that Jesus talks to Nicodemus about, being born again. This new birth into a living hope. And how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Yes, we are to rejoice. We are to rejoice in what God has given us. Because the hope that he gives us is a hope that is different than what the world gives. The world does not offer us the kind of hope that God does through Jesus Christ. The best that we can offer or hope for when the world gives us is a temporary happiness. Maybe that moment of joy or rejoicing. But it's not lasting. It's not something that is secure or actually carries us into the life to come. We can learn from Job. Job 17, verses 13 through 15 reads this way. Listen to what Job says. If the only home I hope for is the grave, if I spread out my bed in darkness, if I say, to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, my mother and my sister. Where then is my hope? Who can see any hope for me? Job says. The hope the world offers actually ultimately will bring despair unless you have this inheritance in Jesus Christ. We only need to see the proof and the proof is suicides are on the rise in our nation. Value of life is decreasing in our nation. We see not only abortion, but this week we have seen a six-year-old shoot his teacher in Virginia. We have seen a 12-year-old girl stab her nine-year-old brother in his sleep in Oklahoma. You can't pick up the paper and not see just the devastation that is happening as value of life has decreased in our society. There used to be a time when we would look at other nations and we would say, what in the world are they doing? They need God. And now we look at our own nation and we say as Christians, what in the world are we doing? We need God. This society has very little future without the hope that we have. If you, in Jesus Christ, if you walk down the street today and you were to stop randomly a number of people, the statistics will show that eight to nine out of ten people will say they have very little hope in anything today. And how sad that is. God has brought us peace through Jesus Christ. He offers a hope that is lasting. A hope because of the resurrection of his son. God offers this hope as a gospel message. He offers this hope. For us because we believe Peter says in this as you you, you get down um, into um, the latter parts of these verses and and he says uh, you believe but you haven't seen him you believe now but you haven't seen him you remember when 
Thomas, and we call him Doubting Thomas, but when you remember when Thomas questioned and Jesus' answer to him, he says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe, and that's us. We, we did not see personally, face to face, the resurrected Christ before his ascension. But we know and we believe in the resurrection of Christ. And this is the living hope, the confidence of the hope, this inheritance that he has given us. And so this morning I want us to look at, I told you I was going to focus on uh, uh, something as we do each year. We kind of pick up a, a little something to focus on in this passage and I want to look at these three words that he uses to describe this inheritance. I think it's important for us to understand and and to hear these words again because this inheritance he says uh, you know it, it will never perish it will never spoil it will never fade he literally says imperishable undefiled and unfading and so what does that mean for us and that first word is imperishable. It shows us that our inheritance is indestructible, it's enduring, it lasts forever. I really like that word, imperishable. As you look at the Old Testament, we know that God had promised the Israelites that they would have an inheritance in Cana, and, and they received that. Uh, the problem is, is that was their earthly inheritance because they were plundered and they were conquered by their enemies. They were ravaged by their enemies. Jerusalem alone, at least 17 times that it was either destroyed or devastated in some way throughout history. But Cana was that promise of an earthly inheritance that God gave them. But God gives an inheritance through Jesus Christ that is imperishable. We're going to, next week, pick back up on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. As we get to chapter 6 in Matthew's Gospel, we will hear these words in verse 19 and 20. And it reads this way, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermins do not destroy, where thieves do not, cannot break in and steal. In this life, in this time, we hold on to material things, and, and all that we have is perishable in this life. I will guarantee you that um, Bill Joyner, if he was up here, would tell you he, he's, he's never seen a car put into a, a coffin. You don't get to take that with you or buried with you. You, you can't take those mater material things are going to mean anything to you uh, once you leave this life. And so Peter is reminding us that this life, this inheritance that we have in Jesus Christ is imperishable. It is a treasure that is in heaven and that we can enjoy even today because we rejoice in it. Since Christ rose from the dead and lives and reigns forever, our inheritance is a lasting inheritance. And so he uses this word imperishable. The second word that he uses is undefiled, and it means that it's 100% pure. If something is undefiled, it's pure, it's unstained, um, it's untainted, it's without sin, it's without evil, it's without decay. Everything in this world is defiled, but everything in our inheritance that God is giving us is undefiled. Everything in this world is stained or spoiled by sin. If you remember when we were studying Romans 8 and verse 19, it said, For creation waits with eager expectations for the children of God to be revealed. And why? Because in verse 21 it says that creation itself also will be set free from the slavery of corruption. And so 
creation, because of the fall, is corrupted. And so this world is sin, sinful, and tainted by sin. But our inheritance is not. It's undefiled. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 3.8 says, I consider all the things of this world garbage. Garbage that I may gain Christ. I consider all garbage that I my, may gain Christ. Everything we have is going to decay or rust, uh, cars rust, our houses break down, need fixing, our money is subject to shifting tides of the economy, um, but the treasure that God has given us, this treasure of this inheritance of eternal life in heaven is protected, is undefiled forever. And then per Peter uses a third word, and that is unfading. It shows that our inheritance is a continuation of something that is wonderful. It's glorious. It keeps shining. Um, it's always of beauty. In Peter's day, this word in the Greek, unfading, would uh, depict something that was, would continue to live, like an evergreen. They would look at an evergreen that was evergreen uh, in, in its color and say, look at its beauty. And so he uses this word unfading to remind us that the supernatural beauty of this inheritance that God has given us is perfect, is beautiful in every way. And so either something's crawling on me or I'm going to knock it off. <laughs> so this, this beauty is something that will not perish in any way. It will not decay. All the strokes of time can't touch it because it's in a place that is timeless. All the taint of sin can't touch it. Because it's in a sinless place. This is what our inheritance is about. Later on in this letter, if you were to turn to chapter uh, 5 and look at verse 4, Peter says, when the chief shepherd's, uh, shepherd appears, when Christ comes back, you will receive a crown of glory. And what does he say? That will never fade away. It's unfading. What a wonderful view and vision we have of this inheritance that is imperishable. It is undefiled and it is unfading. Peter piles these three words in front of inheritance to remind us that this inheritance is secure. There is, there is nothing that's going to stop it from being beautiful or stop it from being sinless or stop it from being imperishable. If you remember in John 10, 29, Jesus said, There is no one that the Father has given me that can snatch you out of my hand. Snatch you out of the Father's hand. And then Romans 8, 39, Nothing can separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our inheritance is secure. And every one of us sitting here this morning and anyone that is watching online, it ought to be a cause for us to rejoice. To have joy in our salvation in Jesus Christ. That it is this inheritance that we have cannot be taken from us, cannot be snatched from, snatched from us. We should be praying with joyful hearts, rejoicing that this last birthright, being born again, is ours, is perfect, is secure in every single way. But somehow Peter, as he's writing and sharing with us this wonderful news of this joy of this inheritance that we have, the joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ, he is reminded, somebody's going to say, but Peter, wait a minute. Look what's happening outside. You know, such and such 
just got killed for their faith, just got imprisoned, just got beaten because they believed in Christ. And so Peter, as the Holy Spirit inspires him, reminds us, for a little while, if necessary, you may have distress from various trials. Yes, we are to rejoice, we are to be full of rejoicing and joy, but he reminds us we have to be steadfast in our faith to praise God. We have to be steadfast. He gives us a reality check. He gives us encouragement. Life's not going to be a bed of roses, and we know that. In fact, we are told that we're going to face various trials. If you are ever sharing the gospel, do not say to, to someone you're sharing the gospel with, trying to uh, have the, the Holy Spirit call them to faith, that if you just give your life to Christ, everything's going to be okay. That's just not, not true. We're going to face trials. And think about the time that Peter is writing this and what he has seen. So he and the other apostles in Jerusalem have been told by religious officials, we're going to beat you again if we hear you talk about Christ. And they go right out the door and begin praising and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not defer them in any way or deter them from sharing the gospel. We see the apostle Paul where he is, he is beaten, he is imprisoned in all that he faces over and over again for the gospel. And we know that Nero, uh, the emperor, by 70 AD, just destroys Jerusalem because of false accusations about Christians. But the Christians of the time stood fast in their faith. Today, Today, not much has changed. There's false teachers that have infiltrated the church and in teaching false doctrine. There are those today who we see from other countries that because of their faith, they can be put to death. In America, I don't know that anyone has been put to death for their faith, but I will tell you this, that in America, many are disowned by their family because they have converted to Christianity. There are those believers that are told to be silent in school or colleges or in the workplace when unbelievers have the free reign to speak anything they want from sexual immorality to promiscuity to evolution or any other damning thing that is a teaching of Satan. Today in our society, if you are a Christian, in many places you are told to shut up and be silent. But Jesus did never, Jesus never said that it was going to be easy. In fact, he actually said the opposite. Matthew 10, 22, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So the question would be, how do we stand firm when assaulted at the very core of our being, at the very core of our faith, at the very thing that we, we believe in with all of our heart? How do we remain steadfast when all we know is pushing against us in this world? Are we weak to stand against the world? The Spirit tells us no. Hear me, church. The Spirit tells us no. Peter says, this is God's word, through faith we are guarded by God's power until the last day. We are guarded by God's power. Look at verse 5 who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed until the last time. We have the very power of God in us to protect us and guard us 
as we face these trials, as we face the temptations that we will go through as, as the world will try its best to pull at us in our faith. Jesus was not abandoned in the grave, and we're not going to be abandoned as we are called by, by God to faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And God will work things, though we sometimes really don't believe this, God will work things for his good and his purpose. It may be in hindsight, as we're going through them, they can be very difficult. But God is strengthening in our faith. Peter uses the example of gold here and says gold is perishable. But we know that fire burns the dross off of gold and makes it beautiful. And the trials that we go through, God is, is working to strengthen our faith. And he's given us the power through the Holy Spirit to do that. Can we claim, verse 5, we are protected by the power of God. What greater power is there? Is there anything else that we should latch on to than the power of God to be with us, to walk with us, to protect us, to guard us as we face the attacks of Satan in this world? I think not. When things go wrong, we're to trust in the Lord for his good. We're to lean into the Lord in every situation and I'm not just preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. We have to lean into God in every situation that we face. We have to trust him and his power to see us through. God promises that he will bring you through it and strengthen your faith because of it. The next time that your faith is persecuted or when you find yourself in a situation when you're questioning God and, and wondering where God is in this moment. Remember Peter's words. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief or, or trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even through refined fire, may be proven genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is what we are called to, to glorify Christ, to give him praise and honor, to rejoice in the inheritance that he has given us through Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter assures us that this eternal life is ours, there is nothing, no trials, nothing in this world that will separate us from the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Each time the Lord gives us assurance of forgiven sins, each time the Lord works in our hearts with praise, each time that we are persecuted and find suffering, it is then that we are strengthened in our faith. We draw closer in our relationship with Christ because he continually reaches us in his mercy and his love and somebody ought to say amen. He continually in his mercy, his grace, his love for us reaches out to us. I don't deserve it. I fail him miserably. But the inheritance is secure and we should rejoice in it. It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. This inheritance that he gives us in his great mercy. We didn't deserve it. And he calls us to it. May we May we, Hope Church, remain steadfast until the day of the Lord in his returning. Whether he calls you and me home at our death or he splits the sky wide open and takes us home together. Let us rejoice in the inheritance. Let us stand steadfast in the faith.
because this inheritance is secure. Thanks be to God. Father, thank you for this passage again that we preach on each of our anniversary services. I thank you, Father, that you have watched over us and you have led us in all things. I pray, Father, that you would guard our hearts in all things. Father, may we stand steadfast in our faith, our love, our hope for you. We pray this in your name. Amen.